wonderful new song for us. What a, a great hope that we have to look forward to uh, as we sing about those truths that are given to us in Scripture about our Lord. Uh, as we gather this morning, even though we have had a wonderful time this past week, uh, with a sobering reminder of our Lord's last week of His earthly ministry, with a study of the Jews' false worship on Palm Sunday, from Romans 10, 1-4, to, to better understand the mindset that was happening, uh, and the people that gathered to worship the Messiah, and then uh, the betrayal and death that they brought forth on Good Friday, and then the joy of his victory on Resurrection Day as we celebrated that last Sunday. Even though it has been a wonderful time uh, in, in our study through that week, uh, I have to admit I am excited to get back to our study in the Gospel of Matthew. If you would turn with me to chapter 6. Specifically, uh, we are in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Christ's first recorded sermon of his earthly ministry. And, and truly, I believe... Probably in my estimation, which doesn't count for a lot, but it does in the sense this would be the greatest sermon that's ever been proclaimed on the face of this earth. Uh, as our Lord himself uh, was teaching, uh, basically coming out and, and laying the foundation for what we are to be as citizens of his kingdom. And so, as we've gone through that in chapter 5, uh, we saw at the conclusion of it, uh, the Lord's warnings about religious doctrine that the people were being taught, and, and the six illustrations that he gives at the conclusion of chapter 5, saying clearly, you have heard it said, you have been taught, you have heard these things, but I say to you, here's what it truly says. And, and I pray that that was encouraging for you to see as we went back to the Old Testament in each of those and saw clearly that, that there was no change. There was simple clarification to what our Lord was bringing. And then in chapter 6, we begin to see the same warnings uh, about their religious deeds, where he essentially is saying, you have seen it done, but I say, don't do it like that. And we're seeing that picture in, in the religious deeds of the people as they're confronted with their hypocrisy, as they're confronted with the reality of their unbelief. And even in the midst of that, our Lord is giving warnings to those who would believe uh, to not be like that as citizens of his kingdom. Now, two weeks ago, we covered the hypocritical and the proper understanding for the use of our finances in regards to helping others. This week, we're going to see the do's and don'ts of our prayer life. And, and we're just going to be able to begin the introduction to this section. We're going to go through verse 8. And there's a great depth of teaching we'll see in verses 9 and following that we'll reference back into this section. Uh, but I want to give us a, a little bit of uh, basis for those things. But even before we begin with that, I want, I want to prepare our hearts this morning for the weight of this section by first taking a minute and recognizing what is an implied truth of this section that needs to be recognized. It's not the explicit teaching uh, that we're going to see, but it's an implied truth that, that is a good reminder for us always as believers. And that is the subtleness and the sinfulness of sin. How it does so easily creep up upon us. The good doctor Martin Lloyd-Jones recognizes this immediately in the section. And I believe so too must we begin there. Although our Lord's illustration is of those who are unregenerate hypocrites and pagans, his warning that is given is for his citizens or believers to not be like them. He's warning those who would follow him that they themselves must not let these practices, let these deceptions creep into their own life. And I think that that's an amazing understanding for us, uh, that as he is warning that the sin of the hypocritical Pharisees and scribes and the practices of ig uh, ignorant pagans can creep into the lives of each one of us so quickly, so easily. I think sometimes when we read through scripture, we see that this is being directed at the Pharisees and we immediately say, well, that's for them. That has nothing to do with me. And that's not our Lord's design in this section. And this is an essential reminder when you consider how we moved we are, we are from our sinful conditions today. It's so easy in this generation to step back and view sin entirely differently than how scripture views sin. We, we've gone through this to some degree in our Wednesday night, uh, just looking at the sinfulness of sin, recognizing the descriptions in, on the pages of scripture tell us that, that sin is a uh, deceiving, enslaving uh, murderer. 
so to speak, a torturous murderer. And that if we were to see it rightly as, as God sees it, as he describes it in the pages of Scripture, we would run or flee in all situations. We'd be hyper aware of these things and recognize them. And we need to understand how important this is. Because I believe, I, I think that in our situation, in our generation, we really believe that because we are not given over to the sins of our former ways of life, or possibly if you were one who the Lord was gracious to save at a, 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 that you were born again at a young age, and so therefore you are not a pursuer and partaker of this world's pleasures, that somehow you are good, that you have arrived. Uh, to give you an example, when, when confronted with the gospel uh, and walking through it when I was in pseudo ministry with teenagers, I would often, uh, in asking them uh, about their salvation, they would often answer my question about their assurance of it with quick quips of, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian because I don't do drugs, or I, don't, I don't sleep around, or they would begin to give other pictures of this view of sin that they had imbibed into themselves that gave them an assurance of who they were when truly they were not. We too often settle into sinful patterns that have become acceptable to society, even religious society. And we miss the war that is being waged in our members, as Scripture describes it. So dangerous. I would caution you with this. This mindset leads to a place where, where those more visible sins that we're so proud that we're not partaking of can easily also grab us and drag us down. I've used the expression many times that a man who falls doesn't fall far. That when you see the, the, the men who have been in ministry, and we've seen so many sad examples, even uh, here in Florida over the last two to three years, where, where multiple years of ministry, and suddenly you see a sin which is disqualifying from the ministry displayed in their life. And, and the reality is that man did not wake up that morning and decide and determine on that day, I will throw my marriage, I will throw my ministry, I will throw my testimony out the window for the pleasures of adultery or whatever the sin may be over the course of many years, not guarding against and recognizing the subtleness that sin has leads to that moment. Those sins within our religious acts are such a great confrontation of the real condition of sin in our life. So many times we see it as a separation when in fact it's all encompassing to all that we do. God commands His children regarding this truth. Hebrews 12 verse 1 is a, is a good reminder for us. He tells us this, therefore, Coming out of chapter 11, the hall of faith, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, such a great example that has gone before us, surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance, and listen to this, and the sin which so easily entangles us. I think a great reminder for this generation is that we as believers need to recognize that there is sin which will so easily entangle us. We must not become arrogant or foolhardy in our pursuit of the Lord in this. He goes on and says, and let us run with endurance the race that has been set before us. This section is also a great teacher for the proper ways to do and not do those things which if you have a new spirit within you, if you have been born again, you have a, a spirit which is hungry for righteousness. It is thirsty for these things. And many of that comes through the practices that we are following. That the righteousness that has been put within us will be worked to the outside through the deeds that we do, thereby giving evidence of our new spiritual condition. Giving unto God. We looked at that at the beginning of chapter 6. And today, prayer. These are foundational realities for the Christian life. And the fact that sin can creep into our very communication with God should be a sobering reminder of the terrible nature of sin and the terrible danger of sin that confronts us every single day. There is no cruise control in the life of a believer. Amen. It truly, sin as scripture tells us, stains our lives and has the ability to seep into every endeavor from our marriages to our parenting to the friendships and relationships that we are granted, to the work that we are commanded to carry out, and yes, even into our religious practices. And all that we do, there is this recognition that it can be subject to this plague called sin. So with that sobering reminder or, or proper introduction, let's read these four verses that our Lord gives as he warns and teaches his citizens about their prayer life. Matthew 6, beginning in verse 5. 
when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. And truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. There is so much happening in these verses, uh, but I would give you this as a, as a preliminary outline. It breaks down extremely well in a don't do this, but instead rather do this in verses 5 and 6, and then again in verses 7 and 8. And so, have that picture Verse 5 is a don't do this. Verse 6 is a but instead rather do it in this way. Verse 7 is a don't do this again. And verse 8 is the conclusion of but rather do it in this way. Our Lord begins with a warning. And that warning is that we are not to have a hypocritical motivation to our prayer life. In verse 5 he says when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. And then he gives us their motivation for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues. So far, so good. And on the street corners, okay. But here's the motivation, so that they may be seen by men. And then he goes forth and says, Truly I say to you, they have the reward in full. And like our almsgiving, the first thing that we notice is that prayer is an expectation of our Lord. He expects that his people will be those who pray. This should be clear by his use of the word when. What you see, he in fact uses three times in these four short verses. In verse 5, he says, when you pray. In verse 6, he says, but you, when you pray. And in verse 7, he says, and when you are praying. One of the first things to realize is that prayer is a foundational expectation of our Lord Jesus Christ as it pertains to the life of his followers. And so we, we recognize is that it's an expectation that we would be in communication with our Father who is in heaven as citizens of His kingdom. He then goes on to warn us of what to beware of. And again, he uses their religious leaders as an illustration of what we are not to do. We saw this section begin all the way back in chapter 5 and verse 20 when he was displaying to them, listen, your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees or you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, this was the greatest example that they had. These were those who were the keepers of the law. As Paul describes himself in Philippians, that he, he was blameless as it pertained to these things. These were those who in every respect displayed a piety, a, a righteousness that in religious circles was to be looked up to. And Christ comes right out and says, no, you don't understand. Your righteousness, the righteousness that brings you into my kingdom, must be greater than than those who are your leaders. And then he gives illustration upon illustration to show the hypocrisy, the self-righteous unrighteousness of those who were their example. Now these examples are Lord's illustrations from the people's lives. They are not exhaustive in his teaching. We saw that through divorce and remarriage. We saw that through the different prohibitions on their doctrine where they had twisted and perverted it. And in the same way, it's important for us to understand that this is not exhaustive in his teaching on prayer. And it's important for us to try not to build practices simply based on these, having missed the intent with the whole counsel of Scripture to guide us. A little historical background about the actual form and practices of the hypocrites should be very informative for our hearts this morning. Hey, we're so far removed from the scene where Christ himself was proclaiming to the audience that was gathered there on that day from Jewish history and culture and other things. We, we are so far removed from the religious practices that I think at times we miss the completeness of what Christ is giving. And so I want to give us a little historical background that I hope, I believe, will be extremely helpful in our recognizing some things about what the Lord is saying and not saying. He is not prohibiting location. We saw that in the giving of alms and understanding that he is not prohibiting location as much as he is defining motivation. And this will give us discernment and how then we should put into practice the words of our Lord in the upcoming verses regarding how we are to pray. Because if you view it as simply, I need to have a secret place where I pray only, you've missed the entire intent 
of this passage. And so let's look a little bit at what the first century Jews, the ones who were gathered as our Lord was teaching this, were expected, how they would have recognized this teaching. Number one, they were expected to recite the Shema, which is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, twice each day. This was an expectation of their prayer life that was practiced, modeled, and commanded by their religious leaders. Uh, in that, let me just read that section so you're familiar with it. In Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, they're told this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit on your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And so the Jews had taken that, which is a wonderful picture and truth for us, and they had made it something of, of a ritualistic and by rote only practice. This was to be done once before sunrise, and a second time it was demanded that it be done before midnight of the same day, where I can picture this scene of realizing, uh-oh, I'm about to fall asleep and I haven't completed my, my religious practice for the day. I need to recite the Shema before that. According to the school of Shemai, the morning recitation was to be done while standing, but the evening while reclining, since Deuteronomy 6 spoke of when you lie down and when you rise up. That was a really holy teaching, wasn't it? It was taking the truth of Scripture and trying to conform it into the practices that displayed your own self-righteousness and piety. Just the same exact thing that we've been seeing throughout Christ's confrontation in the Sermon on the Mount. More than that, and, and I think I have, there's this picture when you look at the history of, of the Jewish religious practices that it, it grew almost with each generation. It was like, how do we separate ourselves as being more holy than the one before me? How do, how do we grow in our religious practices so that, so that my name will be remembered also as one who brought something new and, and of greater stature to our religion? And so you see that these were also accompanying uh, benedictions for each time that were to be inserted in your recitations in a very prescribed order. Uh, for example, the evening recitation of the Shema specifically, you were to be focused on the exodus from Egypt, and so you were supposed to speak these specific uh, benedictions dealing with the Lord bringing His people Israel out from Pharaoh's clutches, from Pharaoh's slavery in Egypt. Also, prayers were offered at the beginning and end of each meal. We oftentimes have a practice of, of praying prior to the meal. Uh, they were commanded to do so at the beginning and end. More than that, they had different prayers which were prescribed based upon the menu. There was a specific prayer that was given when fruit was being eaten. Another for vegetables, another for bread, and another for unripe fruit, sour wine, or locusts were commanded and demanded of the people that they practice these specifically. And I hope that you're beginning to see the picture that these things were being done and where was the relationship to the one whom was intended to communicate? And there was relationship possibly between the people and the rabbi. There was relationship between the people and one another who was gathered there, but there's no essence of communication with God. This was just a practice that was being carried out. As a matter of fact, a huge debate among the rabbis was how much food constituted a meal. My family has had this conversation. Do we pray over the appetizer? What if we're just having dessert? This conversation is uh, sadly, apparently, a common one. But this had become a huge debate that they had to nail down for the people. The consensus arrived at was that anything larger than an olive mandated these two prayers. Each week we know that they uh, had uh, what they called the Sabbath, where they rested, and at the close of each Sabbath, there were three prayers which must be offered. The first one was for the lamp. The second one was for the spices. And the third one was for the habdala, which was the ceremony marking the end of the Sabbath. And so these were required to properly close out your recognition of the Sabbath. Particular prayers were prescribed for special occasions and then taught to the people on how to carry them out. Such as, if you were approaching the site of a miracle... You had to say a specific prayer. If you happened to see a shooting star, you had to pause and say a specific prayer. 
Experience an earthquake. Now, I can understand that one. <laughs> Experiencing an earthquake should drive us to a point of prayer immediately, but there was a specific prayer that was taught and required. A clap of thunder. And then even more than that, even if you missed it, uh, but if you did happen to see it, there was another specific prayer that was to be offered if you witnessed the bolt of lightning that came down. Specific prayers were given for travel. You had to pray a very specific prayer that was taught to you when you approached mountains. And it was a different prayer than when you approached hills. If you came to the sea, there was a specific prayer that was taught that you were to recite and carry forth as you approached the sea. There was a different one for the approach to a desert. And still yet a different one if you were coming to a river. One prayer was prescribed for the receipt of good news. And there was another one for the receipt of bad news. There were specific prayers given for the building of a new home. And there were others for purchasing new cooking vessels. Two different prayers must be offered when entering a town. And then two different ones upon leaving that town. On top of all this, Jews were also expected to pray the tefillah, or what we know as 18 benedictions, three times per day. In the morning, which constituted any time before noon. In the afternoon, which was any time after noon, but before sunset. And then in the evening, before they went to bed, they were required to pray these 18 benedictions. Interestingly enough, over time, there were many shortcuts given that were adopted by other rabbis that would allow for you to only pray the beginning words of them so you could get through them much more quickly. There was also a corporate version of this which was recited together each day as they gathered in the synagogue for prayer and worship. Now, there were some things that did accompany this, the tefillah or the 18 benedictions, were to be done while facing Jerusalem. And this was to be done while your heart was focused on the Holy of Holies and the temple in Jerusalem. Fervency was also greatly appreciated by the Jewish religious leaders of this time. And they would recommend that during corporate prayer, specifically if it was dealing with fasting, an older man who was well versed in prayer, who had children, and whose cupboard was known to be empty was asked to lead the prayer so that he might be wholehearted in the prayer. And so what I want us to see from this is simply that those whom Jesus was addressing, they were committed to prayer. They were devoted in their prayers. They were diligent in the carrying out of their prayers. And yet he uses them as an illustration of what we are not to be like. We are not to be like those who are hypocritical in their prayers prayer life. We remember the word hypocrite comes from the word hypocrite, and we recognize that that was used to describe play actors who wore a mask to fulfill a role. And in the same way, these who were leading in religious practices were carrying these devotions out on a stage, so to speak, for those in attendance, rather than any form of a true communication with God their Father. One commentator quotes another in saying this, the greatest danger to religion is that the old self simply becomes religious. And that is what we see happening. You'll notice if you've read through any of the gospel accounts that Christ is continually confronting the Pharisees who were great practicers of religion with the reality of their heart condition being that which he was concerned with. The heart condition being that which he looked upon. The heart condition being the arena in which he dealt with men. And these were a group who had taken religion and added it to their broken heart condition. Added it to the sinful condition. He describes them as those who are like whitewashed tombs. Who on the outside, they have all these practices that make them look super righteous. That make them look as though they're exceedingly clean. But inside, they were still filled with dead men's bones. And so this is the picture that we need to understand that, that even in our practice of that which is, is good, that which is foundational and given the, the practice of prayer, we need to recognize that sin can creep in. It can creep into us as individuals, but I think even more so corporately. We can come to a place where in church we have this idea that, that this is what prayer is, and so we carry it out specifically in this way. We carry it out in our own lives. We go forth from this place, and, and prayer becomes something that we simply do by rote or tradition. 
And that is never the nature of prayer. It's not the example given of prayer by our Lord. It's not the model prescribed for prayer by Him. It's not the picture that we're given as Paul demands it as well of those who would follow after Him. This picture is that, that's given here is man believing himself righteous because he's checking off religious boxes that he himself is able to satisfy and carry out. Instead of one who has become prayerful because he or she has been born again to a new and living hope. Because they recognize that because of the work that God has done within them, they now have not only the ability to communicate, but a great hunger and thirst and desire. Much more than that, even a necessity for communication. We have often described our prayer life as the uh, exhale of our life. And if you've ever tried to exhale and then hold your breath, you will recognize that that's not possible. In the same way that if you inhale and then hold your breath, it's also not possible. There must be a both and. And we have the inhale is that which we study from God's Word as we were doing this morning. And the exhale is our communication with our Lord personally. He further indicates their motives by pointing out their practices and locations. He gives us great clarity that so the people there could see, listen, look at their example. If you're not sure what I'm saying to you, look to the example of how they carry this out and recognize this truth. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners. Now this phrase has sparked much argument over what our posture should be in our prayer. Oftentimes people saying, well this is why we must bow our knees for it to be true prayer. But scripture doesn't bear that out. You'll see all over the pages of Scripture from, from prayers given in the back of chariots to others as they were traveling on the back of donkeys to, to those who were walking along the road and, and prayers given in a multitude of ways because of the true nature of what it represents. This is not a picture of, of standing in prayer being something condemned by God and this is not the point that Christ gives. However, when considering that the motive is what is being condemned we can see rightly that standing would allow for the greatest visibility of the one who is praying. And was in fact the most common posture for prayer in Jesus' day. You guessed it, they actually had specific prayers that when you prayed these prayers then you must kneel because of the depth or, or the depth of the need that was being prescribed. But generally, standing was the order of the day. The hypocrites who are described here love to pray in two primary locations. The synagogue and the street corner. Now the first indictment is rather obvious and our Lord states it plainly for us in saying that their motivation for their prayers to be seen by men, the location being a, a, a recognition of that. But I would say this, this one creeps up so easily on us. And it is by very nature that which robs our prayers entirely. Because understand this, prayer is all about communication with God. That's the, the simplest way for us to view prayer. That this is about our communication with our Father in heaven. And this practice makes it all about communication with men. It's all about us doing something in such a way that it's displaying something to others. Thereby, there's no possible way that it can carry out the practice for which it was intended. You are not communicating with your Father when your mind is set upon who is watching. One commentator notes it very clearly and says in the same way that prostitutes and modern advertisers pick the main thoroughfares for maximum visibility to apply their products, so too does a man whose desire is for others to see his piety that they may look up to him, place these deeds at an at a intersection of maximum exposure. And I just want to say very clearly, Jesus says, don't do that. That's the simplest way for us to recognize this. Don't do that. Do not let this idea creep into your prayer life as a religious practice of who is watching, who is listening, how might they look upon me because of what I have just said. Don't allow that to even creep in. Now the second indictment is a little bit more subtle, but can also be plainly seen with just a little effort of study. Recognizing, as we've talked about before, that the Greek language does not have the same grammatical construct as our English language. And instead it will use devices such as repetition and the order of words to display emphasis. Rather than exclamation points, bold type, or possibly in our day, all caps. 
it, the Greek language doesn't use those same constructs. And so when you look at the Greek grammatical construct, uh, without going into all the technical details, it is clear that they love to pray after having stood in the synagogues and on the street corners. And the implication is clear that, that there was absolutely no love for prayer apart from them standing on the street corners, apart from them standing in the synagogues. It's implying another indictment, which, which brings, apart from them simply doing it to bring recognition for men, is that this, they have no prayer life. There is no true prayer life in the lives of these men who would do such a thing. And I would say that this is indicting for our own hearts to be examined for hypocrisy. What a clear and easy way to recognize whether there is the practice of hypocrisy in your life. No matter how well you may pray in public, no matter how eloquent and fervent your devotion to prayer might be in the hearing of others, the question is, what is the measure of prayer in your life when there is no one to hear you but God? What does that prayer look like? What is that to be carried out? How does your life reflect that? Because that is the foundation, as we'll see, that leads into the public matter of prayer, which Christ is not forbidding. He's not forbidding location. He's forbidding motivation. And this is a complete perversion of what prayer is at its base level. Communication unto God. If your prayer is summed up in that which you do when others expect it, this is a dangerous place for you to find yourself according to Scripture. This is the picture that's given that these men who are being indicted, who are being used to illustrate hypocrisy and religious deeds, are those who love to pray only after having stood on the streets where they are visible and having stood in the synagogues where they can be recognized. There was no other element of their prayer life apart from that which brought communication or recognition from men. And for those who make their prayers about communication before men, they should expect nothing from God. For they're not even communicating to Him. Why would they? It would be like me speaking to someone over here and expecting someone over here to carry that out. It logically makes no sense whatsoever. And to recognize this, it's like you're praying to those gathered around you, you're communicating to those gathered around you, as though you have some expectation for God's perver or provision. This is a perversion of what prayer is at its base level. And these are two great points of examination for the sin, which can so easily entangle us in our prayer life. Our prayer life is an essential gift and necessity in the life of a believer. You can't survive without it. And I would caution you and, and warn you, as our Lord does, we must guard it deeply and diligently so that no hypocrisy can creep into this arena ever. Jesus is clear. He says, don't do this. Guard yourself. Be aware of these things. More than that, beware against them. Don't do that. Now on a positive note, he then goes on to say, but here's a good way to guard against this temptation. To guard against that which so easily entangles. And so we saw in the beginning that there's a, don't have a hypocritical motivation. But then we see that he tells us, but rather, pray in this way. Verse 6, but you, when you pray, go into your inner room. Close your door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, we've laid a good foundation in verse 5 on our first point of what not to do. And so we're not going to belabor or spend a lot of time on this next point, which is simply giving us a good practice, which guards against the common sin, which we saw displayed in the hypocritical practices of the Pharisees and scribes. To be clear and say this from the beginning, this is not forbidding public prayer, as some have argued. This is clearly taught in other places, and I want to be clear in this. So many times what we find ourselves doing is taking these illustrations in the Sermon on the Mount and resorting again to making a checklist of our own self-righteousness. Oh, I don't pray in public. I have my secret room where I go and do that. Check check. And, and what we've done is we've robbed the intent of confronting our heart condition that the Lord is giving in this. Hey, recognize your motivations because you can equally have improper, hypocritical, self-serving motivations in your closet as you can on the street corner. He's not forbidding 
public prayer. In 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 3, if you want to turn there, you can. It'll be up on the screen. We're just going to look at it briefly. But there's a clear teaching from the Apostle Paul that we are to be those who practice corporate and even public or gathered together prayer. He says this in verse 1 of 1 Timothy 2. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we, we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. And jump down to verse 8 because he clearly then gives us the public nature of this exhortation. Verse 8 of 1 Timothy 2, Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension, displaying the corporate nature and aspect of this specific prayer that's commanded. Jesus and his disciples pray together and in public at different times in the example they set. And finally, we'll see as we move forward in the future weeks in the model prayer, his use of the term are continually. Our Father, our debts, our daily bread, which signifies that this uh, model of prayer is to be done at times before others. And so this reference to praying in secret is not forbidding prayer meetings, as some have opined. It's not forbidding public prayer, as some have arrived at. It is, however giving great practice for two truths about our prayer life that should be foundational to every prayer we pray. The first one we should recognize is this. Our prayer life, we should strive in this to be untempted. Recognizing that sin so easily entangles and creeps into every arena of our life, we should strive in this arena of prayer to be untempted. And this practice that our Lord gives us here is a great way to ensure that you not be tempted to pray in such a way that is communicating more with men than it is with God. If this is a foundation where you guard yourself from the temptation, where you have meaningful prayer that is not simply done in the presence of men, but that you with a desire to communicate with your Heavenly Father would do so in this way, it will build the foundation and practice that will guard against the temptation that crops up when someone might be listening. Secondly, first it should be untempted. Secondly, it should be undistracted. Your prayer life has nothing to do with those who are around you. Your prayer life is communication with your Father in heaven. It is not about those who are there listening. This removes the distraction which so easily takes us away from our intended purpose in prayer which is communicating with our Father in heaven. Our prayer should be undistracted. And to be clear, if this is the way in which you pray in private, it will show itself as you pray in public. It should flow out of a devoted practice of intimate communication with God, because that's what prayer is. Prayer has nothing whatsoever to do with those who are hearing. If you believe that it does, that whatever prayer you have prayed in that belief, you have prayed to those around you, and you should expect nothing from God who is not the one who's receiving that prayer even. Based on this text, it's something that has made an intentional practice uh, for my own life to, to make any time of prayer, whether it be public or private, something whereby I try and shut myself into a closet in the moment, recognizing only one audience. Not concerned with those who may be listening or not. It's not the practice that is, is, is building upon other things. It flows out of what we're already doing. My private time in prayer is the foundation for this to be accomplished in any public setting. There is not an only in secret command, but a necessary practice for our prayers to be untempted by hypocrisy and to be undistracted by the busyness of our lives. I remember there was a point where for the first time I had set, a time, set apart to get away and study and pray. To turn off my cell phone, to step away even from my own home, which is very busy in the raising of kids and things. And I'll never forget when it began to impact me that about three hours in is how long it took for me not to be reading and thinking at the same time. Did I pay that bill? Did I return that phone call? Did I send that email? Oh, I got to get back to this. I, and it took about three hours that initial time for me to, to get to a place where there was an undistractedness. 
and unclutteredness to the nature of which I was seeking to carry out. It's so important for us to, to see those things, and that's what our Lord is giving us. This is understanding that as a only in secret is not the command being given, but sometimes in secret is an absolutely essential aspect of a true prayer life. I would give this as a final warning in this proper practice. Do not think that by praying in secret you are safe from any temptation of sinful pride. I have known men whose set-apart time for prayer was well known by all, and in and of itself drew attention to their devotion to God. I'm not going to try and figure out their motives. I just recognize that that can creep in so easily. Oftentimes people will speak of those who are, who are prayer warriors and, and we have them and, and I'm so blessed to, to be the pastor of a church that truly has men and women who pray. As Spurgeon said when asked upon his trip to America, Pastor Spurgeon, what do you attribute your success in gospel ministry to? And he said, very simply, my people pray for me. For if they did not pray for me, I would be too terrified to get out of bed in the morning. It's a right recognition of that, but understand this. The, the reality of a prayer warrior is something that God himself signifies. Not that you signify by the time you set apart for it. This sin invades everything. I myself have recognized in my quiet or, or alone prayer time that I've had to pause at times and ask forgiveness from the Lord, because at times in prayer I would think, I hope so-and-so knows how I am laboring for them. I wish that they knew they wouldn't feel the way that they feel. And I had to recognize in that moment, suddenly my prayer life had gone from what it was intended to be, communication with my Heavenly Father, and it had become something else entirely, which was pointing to me, even in my own mind, even in that moment. Man, sin invades everything that we seek to do. And so do not believe that simply because you have a private prayer closet or you have a place where you go to be alone and pray, that that guards you from the temptation of pride and sin. Our Lord goes forth to give another warning based on the practice of unbelievers that again can so easily invade our practices as well. We have seen his warnings about not having hypocritical motivations. But here he goes forth in verse 7 and he warns us not to have an ignorant motivation either. And not to have an ignorant. I know that word can be offensive, but I think it's the right word for what we see displayed here. We're not to have a hypocritical, a heart motivation, which is based on pointing to ourselves. But we're also not to have an ignorant motivation whereby we practice things which have no basis in God's word, nor his gift to us to be used. Verse 7. He says, and when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose, or they have imagined, that they will be heard for their many words. In verse 5, he warns about having improper heart motives. And here he warns about improper knowledge motivating our prayer life. His reference to the Gentiles was a common reference to, to those who were pagans to those who did not worship the one true and living God. And so the reference is basically all those who are not Hebrew or are not proselytized into Hebrew religion is the reference for Gentiles. It was just a, a, an easy reference, a common reference to those who were pagan in their practice. Now, just a quick few references for our understanding. When our Lord warn, warns about meaningless repetition, we can see it in many forms and practices today, both outside of and within Christianity. This crops up so easily, just like uh, pride. We don't, we don't go and stand in the corners to pray. Uh, we don't hopefully stand here within our worship service to be seen by men and pray. However, it is so easy to creep in. If you've ever been asked to pray in a certain situation, oftentimes the first thing that happens is, oh, what am I going to say? Oftentimes the first thing that creeps in is, oh, I can't believe they called on me. I don't, I'm not ready. I don't know what to say. Or more than that, I've seen many times when those uh, who would come here for funeral services and other things who are, who are not followers of Christ, they will have a prayer that they printed off the internet that they might read at the service. Sadly, even within those who profess Christ, you will see this practiced often at times. This creeps in in many forms and practices, both outside of and within Christianity. 
I would point out to you very simply or very quickly the, the term for meaningless repetition that's given in this verse is the Greek word batelageo, which is difficult to interpret because it is only used here in the New Testament. This word is used nowhere else, and, and even outside of New Testament Greek, most of the references in the Greek language to this term are used in reference to this text in Matthew. And so it's a little bit of a difficult word to communicate. However, most agree that the prefix for it, bata, is thought to be an onomatopoeia, which if you're an English teacher or have, can remember back to your middle school English, you might recognize that word. It kind of stands out. The term onomatopoeia means that the pronunciation of the word imitates the sound that it describes. For example, a word that we would recognize is the word buzz. The word buzz is an onomatopoeia because it's a word that carries with it both the description of the sound it's describing it is clear from the word itself. And in that, we see the same thing that this word bata it describes most likely a babbling which especially was characterized by pagan prayers. Some of the more common translations of this word would be that which is stammering or stuttering. That which is meaningless and unintelligible is oftentimes the way that it would be translated in the few places we could find it. And so we see this it was a characteristic of pagan prayers. There's a, uh, a book at this time known as the Greek Magical Papyri, in which were contained uh, specific, uh, I don't know, uh, chants and other things that were supposed to bring uh, about magical realities. And so what we see is this is uh, wording where nonsensical combinations of words were thought to have special power. A modern example for you to understand is the word that we've heard probably growing up, abracadabra. It's a, it's a word that has no true meaning, but it's been associated with some special ability to bring about some effect. And in the same way, when you read in the Greek papyri of magic that was about the same time, you'll see these nonsensical words that were brought forth to be repeated in a rote way that was supposed to bring about special accomplishment or special power in the, I hesitate to use the word prayer, but in the chant that you were saying. There are multiple historical sources recording the practice of attempting uh, with, to practice, uh, to, to communicate with pagan deities through the special language. There are several sources that speak specifically of those who would try and adopt three specific language of angels that would allow them to communicate with their deity. And these always came out in every recorded instance as gibberish. To both the one saying them and to those who are hearing them. A few modern examples that stand out. The Buddhist religion uses a prayer wheel for chanting certain prayers repeatedly. And if you've ever witnessed or heard this, it can be off-putting to hear the chanting and the repetitive nature that, that rises sometimes in intensity through the course of it. Many pagan religions use incessant, meaningless chants as part of their worship and communication with their deity to this day. I'll never forget Miss Norma sharing with going past a funeral service when she was in Asia. And as she was there to hear what was going on inside of this, this funeral service, she said, it, I think her word was terrifying to hear this just repetitive chanting and exhortation. We see in Catholicism that there's a belief that lighting candles extends your prayers and that we see the rosary beads as a way of counting your repetitive prayers and ensuring that they have in fact been heard. We have many charismatic circles today where ecstatic gibberish is touted as a special prayer language that is between them and God. And Jesus here warns clearly that these practices have no place in his people's lives. Any belief that they are necessary or even to be practiced is that which has been supposed, Jesus says, or imaginary. And along these same lines, he goes forth and warns about the use of many words. Many of you are saying, man, I hope you get to that part. I believe it was D.L. Moody who said, he can oftentimes tell those who haven't had a vibrant prayer life that week because they try and catch up as they pray for the meal. Many words, he, he warns about this. And now the practice is motivated by the false notion in the pagan world, or the Gentile world, that maybe God is busy and so they need to first get his attention, wake him up, draw his attention unto them so that he can answer their prayers. Turn with me to 1 Kings uh, chapter 18. There's an amazing account that records something similar to this. 
And, and I want to look at it this morning. It's one of my favorite uh, narratives in all of the Old Testament. It has so much for us, I encourage you. And, and I want to read it this morning in case you've never heard this. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we come to this account, if you're familiar with it, where Elijah is confronting the people uh, about their worship of Baal. And in so doing, he, he throws down a challenge. He says this, beginning in verse 28. We'll, we'll read a good bit of this. We won't be able to cover all of it. I just want to read it and make a few, uh, rec recognize a few things from it. Verse 21, Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? For if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal or Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. What an indicting thing for us to recognize that there is no almost Christianity. There is no middle road where we can straddle that fence and somehow be okay. He says very clearly, just as Joshua said, you're hesitating between two opinions. If he is not God, then go on about your day. Eat, drink, be merry, live as though there's no tomorrow and get all that you can from this life. But if he is God, then live as though that's true about who you are. He then throws down this challenge. Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen and let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it upon the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood and I will not put a fire under it. Then listen to this, you call in the name of your God. And I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, well, that is a good idea. And so Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one ox for yourself and prepare it first, for you are many. And call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. Then they took the ox which was given them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they had made. So we have this picture of them from morning until noon, crying out, repeating, going forth before their God, their deity in communication, which we would call prayer, begging, entreating, doing all that they could, leaping about the altar in a way to get his attention. And Elijah recognizes this. Verse 27 is such an amazing... Here's this man of God before 450 of those who were in opposition to him with a crowd that was gathered that didn't know where they stood. And he stands there and begins to mock those who were following this false god. And listen to what he says in verse 7, 27. It came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is a god. Either he is occupied or gone aside, which in the original Hebrew literally means maybe he's in the bathroom. And maybe he's in the bathroom and you need to yell a little louder. Or maybe he's on a journey or perhaps he is asleep and needs to be awakened. And so they thought that was a good idea apparently. It says they cried with a loud voice. And they began to cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out on them. They're not done yet. When midday was passed, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. This is an all-day affair where they, by repetition, by many words, by multiple practices, they're trying to get the attention of their deity. But there was no voice. No one answered. And no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. And he took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood, and cut the ox in pieces, and laid it on the wood. And he said, Fill four pitchers with water, and pour it on the burnt offering, and on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. And at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, 
the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all of these things at your word. Who is he calling attention to? Who is he pointing to in this practice? Is it public? Absolutely it is public. What is the point of it? He is pointing to the Lord and him alone. He goes forth, he says, answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their heart back again. It's not about me. It's about you receiving the praise and the glory of this day. Verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt offering, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. Elijah was a man of few words. He didn't have a lot to say. He knew what was necessary and he brought those words before the Lord in this public setting. Now I want to be clear. The length of prayer is not what Christ is calling into question. We see him, as a matter of fact, exhort his disciples that they did not pray long enough when he was in the garden, that they would fall asleep, that they could not even keep watch in prayer. But what he is giving us is the thought process which says that there are tools that we may imbibe to accomplish what only God can accomplish, that through repetition or the use of many words, this is necessary to either wake God up, to get his attention, to make our point. And Jesus says, don't do that. Don't do that because if you are his child, it is not necessary to chant to wake him up. That having a private prayer language so that he can understand you is is not necessary. He's fully capable of understanding and communicating to you without that. Using many words to convey your point is not necessary. And repeating yourself in a chanting type way so that he might understand how much you mean it is not necessary. Why, why do I know that? Because all of these practices are a denial of our God's true character and nature. It's a denial of his omniscience. It's a denial of his omnipresence. It's a denial of the character and nature of our God, which is what Elijah himself was intending to display to those who are wavering between two opinions. These are denials. And God and Jesus says, don't do these things. Do not practice with ignorance that which others have practiced because there is no point in that more than not being a point it is an actual denial of the true character and nature of our God and this brings us to our last verse and our last point we're told do not communicate with ignorance but rather communicate with him as though it is really him and you believe it verse 8 do not be like them For your father knows what you need before you ask him. I love the picture of Elijah's confidence, his boldness. He had absolutely no doubt whatsoever that his God would answer, that his God would respond because he had a right understanding of the character and nature of God. He had a right understanding of his prayers, communication with God. He had a right understanding of his role and what he was to display. And his prayer was one that in every essence brought those things to the forefront. There was no doubt. There was absolute confidence. In the same way we see Paul describing the gospel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation. How did he know that? Because it was the gospel of Jesus Christ that had knocked him from his horse, had literally in in every way saved him, made him a new creation. He had absolutely no doubt as to the efficacy and power of the gospel. He believed it with everything that was in him because he had experienced it. And in the same way, if your prayer life is based and rooted in the character and nature of our God in right knowledge and is based in a heart that desires to display him out of a love for him that his name might be made great in every arena that you're at, you can also have the exact same boldness and confidence. It's not something you conjure up. It's something which comes out of you because of truth that is within you. Our prayer life is all about communicating with God. It is for those who have a relationship with Him through His Son. And as such, we are to be clear. We are to be confident. We are even to be bold in our communication with Him. We'll see this more fully in the model prayer that we'll be looking at in the weeks ahead. But in the midst of all of that, know this, we are never to forget it is Him that we are talking to. This is an essential aspect of our prayer. 
we are to be those whose prayer life recognizes who we are talking to. That when we go before him, we go before him with confidence, yes. But with fear and trembling, yes. That you are, in a sense, in, in essence, coming into the presence of, of holy, almighty, creator, redeemer, God. And you have been granted that as a gift through the sacrifice of his son. Elijah certainly did not forget this, even though he didn't have the full picture. And Jesus certainly didn't either. But we recognize when he went before God the Father, how did he go before him in prayer? Displaying his need, Father, take this cup from me. If there be any way, Father, it's, I, I don't want it in my flesh. Take it from me. But then an immediate recognition, but you and your will be done. Our prayers are much more about us surrendering to his will than about bending his will to ours. If you have a right view of prayer, you will understand this. I give you an example, an awesome, awesome example that, that will stand out for me till the day I die. I remember sitting with a man that I'd been sharing the gospel with for, for more than a year at this point, meeting with him, watching uh, him wrestle with and, and, and reject and struggle with. And there came a point where one day sitting in my office, he said, he said, I don't, I'm wrecked. I'm consumed. I can't escape this. I've tried. I've run. What do I do? And he expected me to give him some, some rote prayer that he might pray. And, and I said to him, I can't tell you what to do. If the Lord is truly dealing with you, you know, just say to him what it is that you desire. And he bowed his head in my office. And I'll never forget, he said two words. He said, God help. That's all he got out. God help. And then after a few moments, he said, I can't do this. I can't do anything without you. And it was amazing because I want you to know that, that the Lord saved him. And not in response to that, but through that, through that recognition and the fullness of it. And that was all that he could get out. And it was all that was necessary. I know that the Lord saved him, not because of what he said, but because in that moment and from that point forward, his desires for this world were replaced with a desire to know him more and more. His prayer life became something which flowed out of him. I saw him become obedient to him in baptism, in study, in pursuit, in righteousness. You see, true prayer is always about him and us having opportunity to communicate with him. It demands a pure heart with a great devotion to him. And it demands a right view of the one to whom we are praying. This heart and mindset will not allow for hypocrisy nor practice ignorance. It is not complicated. It is rather very simple and very honest. In many ways it is childlike. Because it carries with it the absolute and utter confidence of who we are talking to. We don't have to explain it to him. He already knows. We don't have to convince him of the depth of our motives. He knows what they are. We need to recognize them ourselves. And isn't it amazing that he just loves us to the degree of desiring us as his children be in fellowship with him as this is our greatest good. It's a beautiful gift, this idea of prayer, this reality of prayer. It's a beautiful gift that our God, our Father in heaven, has given to us. Are you using it? Are you using this gift that we've been given. But we have to go a step further and ask ourselves this, are you using it with a proper heart and mind motivation in your practice? Because this is the desire of our Lord for his citizens. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, even as we gather to study from your word about what prayer means, Lord, I I myself am indicted and confronted with the easy entanglement of sin. And Lord, come recognizing uh, truly the nature of prayer flowing from a heart which believes and is trusted in you as the sovereign creator and ruler of this universe. Where else would we go? And so with that right view, Lord, it becomes a desperate pursuit, a necessity in our life. And Lord, I pray that you would grow in my own heart and in the hearts of those here today, a, a better understanding and pursuit of this, our prayer life, which brings about our surrender to your will, our right recognition of your character, and grows us in so many ways as you have 
so clearly intended. Lord, I thank you for this gift and ask that we would use it more fully to your honor and to the advancement of your kingdom according to your will. And I ask this in your son Christ's name. Amen.